pastor, my dear friend, Pastor Brian Harvey. <clears throat> we go back 20 years. I don't know if you all know that, but we met uh, 20 years ago in the context of New Church Star Pool, New Church Star Pastors, and I got a glimpse of his passion for ministry and uh, his love for people. And um, I am grateful that we are both still serving um, in the ministry. And uh, why don't we put our hands together for him for his leadership that is providing. And I also want to say thank you to this outstanding and phenomenal uh, staff who welcomed uh, me and my sons well and sons up there in the, <laughs> in the valley. I call my two heartbeats and they've been out enjoying the Easter egg hunt. So thank you for your hospitality the warmth and your love. We really, really appreciate that. Uh, friends, you should know from the start that I have been raised according to the school of the bees. That means be bold, be brief, and be seated. <laughs> and so we won't be before you too, too long, but there is a word uh, from the Lord. Uh, the scriptures have already been read for us in our hearing. And uh, so what I'll do is offer a brief prayer, and then we'll get into the meat um, of the message. So let us pray. Holy One, of gracious One, we thank you now for the privilege and honor of being able to call upon your holy and your righteous name. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my rock, my rock, my redeemer. Speak to me through and for me. You may get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before I get started, did you all see in the article recently about this 94-year-old grandmother who was getting married for the full time? <laughs> Did, did anyone see that? 94 years old, getting married for the fourth time, and I have to tell you, um, the, the, the article captured the response from the news reporters. They love Lord Barrett for Frank Lawn, and uh, there she is getting dressed, and she has to give this report. And uh, she says, well, when I was in my 20s, I married a banker. I didn't want to be forced, I married a banker. But unfortunately, one day they robbed a bank, and they shot him, and he fell to his death, and he died. And I, in, in my 40s, I didn't want to be lonely. I needed some entertainment. So I married me a circus ringleader. And I was able to travel and see all these wonderful shows. And uh, one day he was walking from the tightrope. And he slipped and he fell to his death. And he died. Oh, bless his heart. And uh, in my 60s, I said, I need to get my heart right to, to meet the Lord. So I'm going to go ahead and marry me a preacher. So when she was 60, she married a preacher. And this guy was so good, he could preach the darkness out of anybody and light into them. Right? And uh, she says, today, now that I'm 94 years old, I'm going to go ahead and marry me a funeral home director. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one news reporter got there late, and uh, the, the news reporter asked, can you just give me the short version of your story? She said, sure. I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four for the good. <laughs> on Sunday, so if you didn't get it, if by Easter, you'll get it by the end, amen? <laughs> amen. I like to have fun in the context of worship, so uh, um, as that lady had a plan, Jesus also had a plan to transition from palms to paradise. I want to begin our time together by asking a simple question. What if the fate of the free world rested upon your choosing to carry the cross? Let me ask it differently. If the future of the world depended on you carrying the cross, would you carry it? If the future of the world depended on you carrying your cross, would you carry it? I raise that question to highlight a sense of what Jesus faced while carrying the cross. The future of the world was held in balance. The future of the world was at stake. What stared him in the face was the clarion call to carry a cross that would result in him wearing a crown. But what crown? Well, I'm glad you asked. The crown of forgiveness. The crown of redemption. The crown of new life. The crown of eternal life. The crown of granting us access to the Father. As we understand, communion with the Father comes through union with the Son. Friends, as I search for language to describe the cultural, contextual and paradoxical backdrop of what Jesus encountered as he entered Jerusalem, I found comfort in, in a parallel in the words coined by Charles Dickens in the tale of two cities. And that though the crowd shouted Hosanna to God in the highest, one could argue that it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. 
It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. Ironically, my friends, in one hand, Jesus had the purpose and the pride of the kingdom of God, while in the other hand, he had the pressure, pain, and persecution of bearing a cross. Not just any cross, but a cross that will bear the sins of the entire world. And though realizing this paradox, he still chose to enter Jerusalem to complete his sacred work. A work that considered us as we were still in our sins. Speaking of entering Jerusalem, one day a couple entered a jewelry store on their wedding anniversary. And though the husband was an agnostic, the wife had been listening to Christian talk radio. He asked her, why are you looking at crosses today? And the wife replied, I heard an evangelist say in his talk that if you want to follow Jesus, you have to deny yourself take up a cross, and follow him. So I want this one. The husband says, well, does it have to be the one with the diamonds on it? <laughs> the jewelry store manager overheard their conversation and approach. He said, man, I overheard your conversation. And as a Christian, I need to tell you that Jesus wasn't talking about the kinds of crosses that we wear around our necks, but rather, Jesus was talking about the crosses that we bear in our hearts and souls. Amen, church. Far too many believers today are wearing him outwardly, but, not, uh, but are not bearing the fruit of him inwardly. They have managed having a relationship with prayer, but have missed his presence. John confirms this in John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. John says it this way, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Amen, church. Amen. Friends, in the book, You Lost Me, David Kennedy makes a great point. The book is entitled, You Lost Me, While, Why Young People Are Leaving the Church. Why Young People Are Leaving the Church. He captured the essence of why thousands every week are now leaving the church. It speaks to this disconnect or this issue within Christianity. They're leaving the church because a lot of young people have discovered that a lot of believers, a lot of Christians, are Christians only in theory, but not in practice. Let me say that again. Young people are leaving the church based upon David Kinnaman's research because they have found a disconnect. They have discovered that people who claim to be Christian have practiced theory, but they do not put it into practice. In other words, they're emphasizing theory and not practice. Friends, there are so many versions and nuanced attempts to identify with Jesus. Uh, results in irrelevant works as an outward showing. But in order to advance the agenda of God's kingdom, the church will need conviction, transformation, and witness from inward growth. Amen. Is this microphone working this morning? <laughs> Amen, church. Friends, Jesus was entering, if I could just transition now to the theological framework, Jesus was entering Jerusalem during the Passover feast. Now, don't miss this. During the Passover feast, traditionally, they would sacrifice a lamb during the Passover feast. But look at Jesus. Jesus is entering Jerusalem as the Son of God, preparing himself to bear the cross for our sins. So in essence, he entered as the Son of God, but he's also entering as the sacrificial Lamb of God. So not only did he enter Jerusalem, but he also offered himself as the Lamb of God. Not just any Lamb. But as John describes him in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. I had the privilege of meeting Stephen Lawrence 
uh, one of the original Tuskegee Airmen in Gainesville. Actually, Stephen is about 98 years old and he served as a bag boy at Publix. Great sense of humor, warm spirit. He's preached with me several times when I was in the context of Trinity and I met the church in Gainesville um, at our 635 service. This is a delightful person. Well, he told me the story of the celebration of when the movie Red Tails was being released. And he was blessed to receive the applause and the compliments from the cast. And he said a few of the guys came up to him and they bowed their heads and they took a knee to him. And he quickly told them, stop, please don't do that. Because the same Lord who woke me up this morning, woke you up this morning. And the same God who gave you life, health, and strength, gave me life, health, and strength. He says, never forget this. You and I are all made equal at the foot of the cross. We are all equal, amen, church, at the foot of the cross. In other words, there is no distinction between Jew or Gentile, male or female. Slave or master, black or white, rich or poor, educated or not, we are all equal at the foot of the cross. In other words, Jesus leveled the playing field and he granted us access to experience a grace that would unite us with him. So somebody said he entered. Yeah. Not only did he enter, but he also offered himself. And the third move is this, he obtained. He entered Jerusalem as the Son of God. He offered himself as the sacrificial lamb of God, and he obtained for us access to forgiveness, redemption, and eternal life. And for that, I think we ought to give God a hand. <laughs> but the question remains, why? Well, I'm glad you asked. You know I have a lot of great questions. <laughs> Jesus do this? Well, Jesus did this. Well, can I give you the David Allen contemporary version? Yeah, yeah. Jesus did this because Jesus had a bucket list. Raise your hand if you have a bucket list. Raise your hand if you saw years ago this movie called The Bucket List by Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson. Well, a bucket list are, is a list that you want, a list of things you want to accomplish before you depart. Jesus had a bucket list that had you and I at, 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 at his heart. In other words, he loved us so much, we were at the top of his bucket list. And that's why he entered, he offered, and he obtained forgiveness, redemption, and eternal life for us. But the question is, what's on your bucket list? What's on your bucket list? In other words, Jesus' bucket list was intended to glorify the Father. Everything Jesus did was in obedience unto God. Everything. He did not, he didn't do one thing without hearing from the Father first. And everything he did, it was in obedience to glorify the Father. But what about your bucket list? I mean, many of us have bucket lists that include traveling to some exotic place, going to Haidam, going to Italy to experience the fruitful wines of Greece. Buying a vacation house in the Virgin Islands. Hello, church. Amen, church. <laughs> but Jesus' bucket list was not for himself. Rather, it was for you and I. Again, everything he did was in obedience unto God. It was to glorify the Father and fulfill God's agenda. What on your bucket list is listed to bring glory and honor to the Father through the Son? This Palm Sunday, I challenge you to reassess your daily and weekly actions and ask yourself whether this is for my pleasure or for God's glory. I'm reminded of uh, the words of John Wesley, who said as I transition to a close, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can. To all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Amen, church. I'll leave you with the thoughts of uh, Joseph Gordy. Joseph Gordy was an Olympic um, runner who made it to the Olympics back in the 1980s. And there, in the middle of the race, Joseph somehow fell down and scratched his knee badly and dislodged his shoulder. 
And there, in the middle of the race, Joseph had to make a decision whether to stay put or to finish the race. And so, Job, though he was, you know, bloody and, and, and shoulder in pain, Joseph got back in the race and finished the race. Catch this, 30 minutes late. Media came up to him and asked Joseph, why in the world would you decide uh, to finish this race? The race ended 30 minutes ago. And here's what Joseph told him. Joseph said, I don't think my country of Tanzania threw me 5,000 miles just to start the race. But they flew me 5,000 miles to finish the race. I don't think Jesus allowed himself to enter offer and obtain for us so that the church can just start the race. I don't think he allowed them to pierce him in his side so the church can just start the race. I don't think Jesus allowed them to press a crown of thorns in the crown of his head so the church can just start the race. But I think he did that and a whole lot more so that we might receive a grace to finish the race. Amen, Amen church. Amen. And Pastor Adam, well, how do we finish this race? Well, I'm glad you asked again. <laughs> we finish by entering a community and a setting. We finish by offering ourselves as servant leaders. And we finish by obtaining a grace where people can see and experience the love of God through something we have said or done. That's how we finish this race. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Amen.